one of the things I, 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 I would read about was movies, the history of cinema, the history of Hollywood, how movies are made and everything. And I figured all this stuff out by the time I was like 10. Wow. And I actually uh, started making little movies. So one of the hobbies I had at that age was like DJing, collecting music, um, dabbling in electronic music production with a friend of mine who was a, a skilled musician. At some point, I started working in the security business, eventually, you know, trained up, did different courses and became a private investigator and did that for years. I did a little research to find out how to become an English teacher. I thought it was as easy as going to a school and applying <laughs> because we're not talking about high school. We're talking about private companies. To my surprise, I needed to have a university degree and a teaching certificate specializing in English. Um, so I went back to university in my 40s. But now when I make my videos, I'm putting music in there. I'm, I'm selecting music from a licensing service, trying to match music and image, even a little bit of editing. So that's a little bit like DJing. It's, what was always really natural was when that student or another teacher asked me a question about the language, a light bulb would switch on and something would transform in a second with me and my mind would dive inside the language and then I'd be off. Welcome back to the Grind and Gratitude Show. If this is your first time tuning in, thank you so much. If you're an avid listener, you already know I got a lot of love for you. And if you've been listening to the podcast for a while, you know that I've been doing a lot of solo episodes. I've been traveling for a few months and now I'm back and I have a very special guest. And you know, I always bring you guys really great guests who are going to add some value to your life and to your business. And so I'm super excited to have this person on. So let me tell you a little bit about this guy. This is Paul Duke. He's an English teacher, online writing coach, podcast and live stream host, and video creator from Vancouver, Canada. He's the creator of the YouTube channel, The Grammar Detective, which I love. I can't wait to talk about that, uh, featuring the web series English Weirdness interesting um and the weekly live stream called hard boiled english live which he streams from youtube facebook linkedin twitter twitch you know live space he's everywhere all around the world paul grew up in rexdale and oakville and later moved out west to vancouver where he studied interdisciplinary studies and cognitive linguistics at the university of british columbia in vancouver and the i'm going to mess this up ritsumikin <laughs> Richard Meekin, uh, University Graduate School of Language and Education and Information Science in Kyoto, Japan. So I can't wait to hear about that. His video com uh, content combines his passion for inductive analysis of grammar with a playful detective, quote unquote, detective theme, a reference to Paul's previous career as a private investigator. Oh, man, we're going to get into this. And uh, in the security industry. He also combines his passion for cinema, music, and literature, and animation, and his previous career as a DJ. Man, this guy's done everything. <laughs> Welcome to the show, Paul Duke. Oh, thanks for having me. I'm extremely excited and grateful for this opportunity, Danny. I really appreciate it. And I Absolutely. hope I can offer something for your audience. Oh, oh you definitely can. Um, before we get into it, uh, I want to just tell everybody, look, I met Paul through my uncle Colin, who's who's a chef. And back in the day, you know, we'll talk a little bit about the culinary career. And I remember my uncle saying, man, you really got to meet this guy. He's a really interesting guy. You got to, you have to meet him. You guys got to just catch up. And a couple of months ago, I was out in Vancouver and I, call, I called up Paul. I said, look, man, you got 30 minutes so we can sit down and just meet in person, have a conversation. So we get together and 30 minutes turns into over three hours. <laughs> and we had an amazing conversation about so many different things. And I, I, at that moment, I told you, I said, look, I got to get you on the podcast. I can't wait. And so now you're here. And, and thank you for taking the time to be on the show, brother. Uh, my pleasure. Actually meeting you that day and spending that time with you. Thank you for the making the time because I know you were uh, on a vacation of sorts. That was one of the highlights of my year. And uh, I think we met on Zoom. We made a point of meeting on Zoom a few years ago That's or right. at the start of the pandemic, maybe um, after your uncle Colin had put us together. But meeting in person was just, it's just one of the magic things that 
people my age and maybe your age too don't take for granted because we grew up before the internet <laughs> where such a you lose track of friends man they're gone yeah they're out in the wind forever right so being able to arrange things and make a connection and there we were sitting at that cafe all afternoon that was incredible and that remains one of the highlights of the last few years oh, that's so amazing, that was man. that's so amazing so cool. and thank you for taking the time and, and you're right i think you know for me i don't think i've always realized this and you can talk a little bit about this because you played sports and stuff but it's really about the the importance of having a community or having yeah. people that are going in the same direction that you're going you know what i mean so as soon as i connected with you i was like you're trying to do things in the world. You're trying to help people, not trying, you yeah. are. And so for me, that connection, I think is really important because you can talk about this, you know, as an entrepreneur, sometimes it's really lonely, right? Oh yeah. <laughs> so like, we're going to get into that, but before we go too far down, talk a little bit about, you know, how you started this whole English detective thing, because to me, it's mind blowing. Oh. Like, I've seen, I've logged into a number of your, your live streams over the years on LinkedIn and YouTube and some on Facebook. And it's really kind of fascinating to me that you took on this detective persona and really break down English. So how did it all, first of all, tell everybody what it is and how it came about. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's a, it's really hard to explain it without really kind of providing a bio because it's sort of the culmination of a really a life spent twisting and turning and actually uh shout out to your book because when we met you gave me a copy and i've since read it and i love the way you kind of break your coaching philosophy into segments that that are um you know sort of life hacks or whatever you want to call it but systems and techniques for improving your life and there are certain segments that i realized i'd been following for most of my life uh, certainly my adult life, but then I also realized there were chapters with concepts that had been completely missing from my life for a long time. So for example, you talked about aligning with people that are going in directions like you and how you and I related on that level, even though our projects might look very different. Um, that is new to me for most of my life. And I'm 58 now, Danny, most of my life, I felt, I have felt very, very alone in everything I've done, even when I played team sports, mm. for example, and I was, uh, you know, I write as well, and I've been writing about this recently. I played football and I was a wide receiver. So wide receivers often feel really alone out there in the, in the flank, right? Yeah. And for me, it was never a team sport. It was me versus the DB who was covering me and we'd be running down the field and then it was just me and the ball. Right. So I, for me, it was almost like a, uh, a creative art because it, it, I was I was on my own, although I was part of a team. Anyway, that segment really, really resonated with me because I've always felt alone. And part of that is me and my personality. I'm, I'm, I'm an extreme introvert and I can withdraw from all kinds of social contact. Mm -hmm. And that has that has made me sort of um, unwilling or I don't want to use the word afraid because it's not exactly a fear but unwilling to go out and take the steps in the direction i dreamed of mm -hmm. by myself and i had no support around me to push me or you know push me or pull me in those directions so long story short my life has been a really winding snake of a road so uh, let me go back a little bit and so i so we have some dots to connect here yeah um Growing up, I was a very shy, reserved, introverted kid, no friends. Um, but what I loved to do was read, write, draw pictures, and watch movies. And I would spend entire days at the library. My mother would drop me off at the library instead of a babysitter. The wow. librarian knew me. Um, and I would just spend days in there. And one of the things I, 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 I would read about was movies, the history of cinema, the history of Hollywood how movies are made and everything. And I figured all this stuff out by the time I was like 10. Wow. And I actually uh, started making little movies. But, you know, growing up in, in Ontario at, in the 70s and 60s, th there was no way a young kid could dream about make, being a filmmaker. There were no film school programs. There was no industry in Canada to speak of, really. 
and the idea of like growing up and going to Hollywood, like physically moving, not in the cards. Right. So I kind of abandoned those dreams, got into high school and, you know, I grew a little bit in size, realized, you know, okay, maybe I do need to start being a little more social, get involved with sports um, and kind of abandoned my childhood dreams. Finished high school, wasn't sure what to do. I tried all kinds of little odd jobs. Um, you know, I was encouraged to adopt that idea that um, I just needed to have a job. So, uh, you know, going to university and school wasn't in the cards for me. I didn't have the money. My family didn't necessarily support the idea. It, it seemed far-fetched and my grades sucked. <laughs> uh, so I just started doing a lot of different jobs and uh, at the same time pursuing hobbies. So one of the hobbies I had at that age was like DJing, collecting music, um, dabbling in electronic music production with a friend of mine who was a, a skilled musician. We even performed on stage. Um, you know, I had abandoned filmmaking, but my creative desires never left me. So it, for me, music was an outlet for that. Again, never thought of things like that as career making. I just, I just believed that all I needed was a job and then do this for fun. And that was going to be life. Right. Uh, and then uh, at some point I started working in the security business eventually, you know, trained up, did different courses and became a private investigator and did that for years. A private and, investigator? <laughs> yeah. <Wow. laughs> and um, doing security work like VIP protection, bodyguard stuff. I got all went through all different training programs. Um, and that, you know, for a young person, that was, I thought that was kind of cool and macho and look at, look at the, you know, look at the slick stuff I'm doing. Of course. And that kind of carried me away. And I, I moved out West because there was a, a security company out here I wanted to work for. I also did a, odd jobs continuing because, you know, got to pay rent. So uh, I worked part-time as both the front doorman and a part-time cook in your uncle's kitchen. That's crazy. <laughs> at Joe Forte's in Vancouver. Um, so on weekend evenings, I would be the doorman and it wasn't like a bouncer job, but I had to resort to that. Sometimes I wore a suit and tie and my job was to control the door like a gate because they had a really strict liquor license limit. So I would, you know, as elegantly as possible, talk to the patrons and say, okay, well, I'll let you in shortly. And occasionally had to remove somebody, but, um, and then became really good friends with your uncle Colin. We ended up rooming together we had a blast. At some point, though, that whole cycle of doing jobs that um, didn't really speak to me grew, I grew tired of that, right? The security industry, it was almost like I was, I was still connected to my passion for movies, but now I was kind of in a movie. Uh, I, was, wow. I was a detective in a movie. It was like I was doing that work, but I was imagining myself in a movie. So there was still this weird thing that I couldn't shake. Um, but I wanted to change my career path and all that. I met the woman who is now my wife, and she was an English student at the time in Vancouver. This is now early 2000s. And I started helping her with her English homework. And that connected me to a passion for language that I had had as a young kid, voracious reader. And the longer we decided to stay together and make a go of our relationship, uh, she was from Japan, so there was the possibility that we'd have to go and live in Japan. I was always open to either. But if I went to Japan, a very safe and clean country, there's no use, there's no work for a security man. <laughs> it was like, what can I do there? So she said, well, you're really good at helping me with my, with my homework. Why don't you become an English teacher? I thought, yeah, that would be kind of cool. I could spend my day talking language. So I, I did a little research to find out how to become an English teacher. I thought it was as easy as going to a school and applying <laughs> because we're not talking about high school. We're talking about private companies. Right. To my surprise, I needed to have a university degree and a teaching certificate specializing in English. Um, so I went back to university in my 40s. Wow. Yeah. What was that experience and, uh, like? Oh, it was, it was crazy. It was awesome because... I had come from a lifestyle of like working seven days a week, sometimes 
around the clock with no sleep. So for me, university was a holiday. It was <laughs> totally stressless. Wow. I got to study and spend my days l learning about things I was interested in. Right. So com compared to my classmates for whom that was the most stressful experience they've ever had, young people when they're 19, uh, I, you know, I, I missed out on the university experience of the social life because I was an old man among the kiddies. Yeah. But for me, the, the, the opportunity to learn again was really exhilarating and l led me into getting eventually um, a job teaching English at a school, a private English school here in Vancouver. And it was fantastic. I enjoyed some great success at it. I felt immediately like, yeah, I can do this. This is what I should be doing. And then a funny thing happened. After I'd been doing that for about eight years, and I wouldn't say I was bored with it, but I was into a routine. It's impossible to be bored because you're always meeting new students from right. all these different countries around the world. But I knew that at some point I would have to think about what retirement lo would look like for me because mm -hmm. I had um, old injuries in the legs that were getting arthritic. Standing up all day in a classroom was wearing on me. So then I thought, okay, my next move would be moving online using new tools that were appearing like Zoom and doing some tutoring and coaching online for mm -hmm. English. So I thought, how do I do that? Well, I need to get a website to promote myself. Okay, so I learned how to make websites and, um, and then using Zoom and stuff like that. So I needed camera technology and all that stuff. And I thought, okay, well, you know, how does someone hire a tutor? They look for an ad on something like Craigslist. And, uh, you know, they, they click and they send you an email. They never right. see you. I, I want them to be able to feel comfortable hiring me. So I need a video clip of me teaching. One of my students in my English class was an aspiring filmmaker coming who came to Vancouver from Mexico to attend film school. I knew he had a camera. So I said, hey, man, can you stay after class? tonight and just shoot me filming uh, I'll do a little mock lesson for my website and he said yeah sure I said I'll, I'll buy you pizza or whatever we'll, we'll, we'll have some fun so we did that and we had so much fun we started brainstorming hey what else can we do with this so we made another video that was uh, planned and scripted and so on and that became the first episode of my web series called English Weirdness and we invited a, another student, a young lady from Japan to be in the video with me. And uh, her mother was involved in the education ministry in Japan. They saw the video and invited me to participate with a brand new school that was opening. And they financed the production of more episodes of this series. That's so then me and, my, me and my volunteer camera guy, we had a little budget to work with. And so we started making this series called English Weirdness, and um, the school had license to use it in, in Japan. I was doing online lessons with them, and I started putting these videos on YouTube. And for me, that woke me up to the reality of like, what the hell am I doing? I'm an English teacher, but now I'm making videos, and it all feels so natural because I wanted to make movies when I was a kid. And now the technology is caught up. I don't need film school. I don't need to go to Hollywood. We can do this right here. Right. And uh, so I started just, you know, going crazy with it. Um, that became the series English Weirdness. The pandemic struck and I decided to, you know, leave the school. It, it, the pandemic crushed the English language school business here. Yeah. yeah. So I, I moved permanently online as an online tutor and coach. And I started doing my live stream, my weekly live stream. Now, here's where it gets funny, and I'll, I'll wrap up in a second because I don't want to dominate the conversation, Danny. Oh, sure. But uh, I had the, the, the equipment to do live lessons, uh, so I thought, what else can I do? Well, I always loved answering weird grammar questions at, at the language school, and I had a knack for it. Even other teachers would come into my class and ask me, hey, how do I explain this to a student? So I thought, okay, I'll do a show where I just answer questions. The audience asks grammar questions and I answer them. Nothing planned puts me on the spot. It's kind of a nice, fun challenge. And uh, it's unique. No one's doing that on YouTube. So I started doing that. I needed to learn how to build a YouTube channel, though, and how to promote it and all those things. So I got in touch with a YouTube 
uh, coach and he took a look at my branding and all that. He said, this is ridiculous. You have no brand. You have no presence. And I started telling him the story that I just told you. And he goes, wait a minute. You were a private investigator. You were a detective. I don't see that anywhere on your YouTube channel or your Biden. I said, yeah, it's got nothing to do with it. He goes, it's got everything to do with it. That's you. He said, you got to lean into that and play it up. I said, okay, okay, cool. I'll, I'll start calling myself the grammar detective. I'll, you know, get a costume and uh, really play with it. Um, and that'll set me apart. That'll differentiate me from every other English teacher on YouTube. And there are plenty. And uh, it all kind of came together right there. My teaching career, my passion for language, my former career as an investigator, my passion for dressing up and playing detective, my passion for filmmaking, everything came into this one package. So that's how the Grammar Detective live stream uh, came about. It, it was just this long snake, and that's that's the short version. But, uh, but it's this me, long like, snaky version. To me, this is like uh, it, it's amazing. Like I, I I think you know a lot of people don't make connections, right? Like once you have a dream and it doesn't happen the way that you want it to happen, it's gone. It's like, that's never yeah. gonna happen for me. I'm too old. I can't go back to school. I don't have the credentials. And and I think your story is so amazing because some people find it hard to do one or two things that they're passionate about or to bring back something they're passionate about and connect it yeah. to what they're currently doing. You did that with four or five different things with music, cinematography, English yep. language, your detective career, you know, uh, the, your your love for technology. And yep. so I think this is a great lesson for individuals is like your time is never up. Like there's yep. always a way to do the things that you love, even if it doesn't make sense to anybody else but you. Yeah, Like that's what I'm hearing when you're saying this to me. It's like, absolutely. If you were to say this to somebody, they'd be like, that's crazy. You wanted, you had this desire for music and cinematography and and now you're combining them all together everything yeah you and mentioned I think music. that's really important yeah absolutely music um you know i had no musical talent and i stopped uh making music with my my friend aaron shout out to aaron back home we gave that up in early 1990s he went on to play with bands but i gave it up but now when i make my videos I'm putting music in there. I'm I'm selecting music from a licensing service, trying to match music and image, even a little bit of editing. So that's a little bit like DJing. It's a little yeah. bit like uh, putting the pieces together. And, and it, you're absolutely right. It's like I almost tried to run away from my, my dreams and habits. Mm -hmm. I almost tried to ex escape them or deny them by going into a business like the security business. That was never a dream or a passion of mine. It just seemed like a cool thing to do. Uh, I could do it. I've done a lot of things that I was able to do, and there and I could do them well enough that people would pay me. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't mean I was passionate about it. You know, um, it just meant that I that I was learnable. You know, I was I, I could be taught and I could learn things. Mm -hmm. But I couldn't escape those things because the, the older you get, here's the other truth that pops up: as you get older, you realize. You start thinking about death and you start thinking, okay, when I'm on my deathbed, what am I going to be grateful for? And what am I going to regret? Mm. And I thought, well, if I don't try to make a movie of some kind, I'll regret that because I know I can do it. I've just never had the guts to try. Um, or like if I didn't, uh, I don't know, write a book, that's another project I have on my back burner. It's like, you start realizing the things that are of absolute value and the stuff that's really just junk that you can easily live without. When you start thinking about the end, and mm -hmm. I started doing that in my late 30s and 40s. I was alone in my late 30s. I had no relationships, barely any friends, and I was going in a direction I wasn't really proud of. So when I decided to you know, give myself the permission to, to try to live a decent life, I had to ask the question, which, which was, what does that look like? And that's the other thing I noticed in your book, that I am statement concept. I could never answer that. Mm. Not in my 30s, certainly not in my 20s or 30s. But I started asking myself that 
you know, who am I in my, you know, late thirties, early forties. And it was, a, it was hard to answer. But in the end, the answer was obvious. I am the little child that I was, you know, I remember someone asked me a question one day, I was in a really bad state for a while and I sought some help and, uh, with a therapist and the therapist asked me a really simple question. They said, when you were a child, and your mother said, go out and play. So you had permission to go and do whatever the hell you want. Just come back by dinner. That's how we rolled back then. Yeah. No helmets. No. Um, no. Right. Go play in a tree. You, you were free to choose whatever the hell you wanted to do. It was all play. Right? It was all just games and imagination. It wasn't like I was going to, you know, start walking down the freeway. This therapist asked me, you know, when you were free to go out there and when you were a child, your mother gave you permission to do whatever you wanted. You didn't care about money. You didn't care about weather. You didn't care how you looked yet because you hadn't hit puberty and were, you weren't thinking about the women yet. What did you choose to do? And I said, well, for me, I'd go out there and make up stories and play act movies and pretend we were in a movie. And the therapist looked at me and said, that's you. That's who you are. That's what you need to be doing. And it was just so, such a clear insight for me that after all that, all those years, that was the thing I was still so passionate about, but I hadn't given myself permission to even think about it in about 25 years. So, you know, I went to university and studied all kinds of things. One of them was English teaching because I wanted a practical job uh, that I could do right after university. You know, I, I was in middle age, I needed to earn some money. Right. But I also studied all these other things that I was interested in, literature, cinema, all that stuff, to give myself that gift of, you know, really diving into the things that I liked. So there's this idea in, in your book that I just blew me away of this I am statement, right? Mm -hmm. Like, who are you? That was a question I couldn't answer mm -hmm. for most of my adult life. And, and I think that's, um, a, I mean, that's really powerful what you just said. I mean, you said so many things there. But it's really like giving yourself, you know, I talk about giving yourself permission to fail and yeah. having the discipline to follow your curiosity. Yeah. And I think for a lot of us, we think with our adult brain and our adult brain tells us it's too late. You're not qualified. Yeah. You don't know how to do this. So-and-so is the leader in that industry. You're never going to be them. And and so we talk ourselves out of even trying things like even, yeah. and it's in you. Like if something keeps calling you, and something keeps calling. Like when I was working in the corporate world, I knew it wasn't for me. Yeah. You know, my whole thing was I grew up in low income housing. Everybody talked about getting a quote unquote good job. Yeah. So I was like, went to university, hated it, dropped out of university, had the shame of being a university dropout. And, but I had to get a good job. And somehow I found myself years later in the corporate world. And it was almost like I felt like I was lying because I'm like, I'm with people who got master's degrees and all this. And I, I, I'm a dropout. And, and because of that, I, I it kind of just reminded me I should be doing something else anyway, but I kind of carried that shame. And then what happened was it kind of brought me back to like, I'm meant to help people unlock something within them. Like I've always mm -hmm. been that way. And a lot of people don't know this, Paul, but my very first paid job ever, the very first job when I was 14, because we were actually allowed to have a job at 14 years old. I worked for Parks and Recreation, and I was 14 years old teaching basketball to four and five-year-olds, coaching and mentoring them and teaching them basketball. And one day I thought about that. I'm like, and this is after I was already coaching people. I was like, this whole time I've been searching for this good job and trying to find my way in life. And the, the clue was already there. My very first job was as a coach. Now yeah. my name is Coach Stone. I help people with life coaching and business coaching. So I think a lot of people don't connect the dots. Like, yeah. And I love the way that you connected all those things and brought them together. But also it's the, the, the thing is, when you ask yourself, who am I? and you're still trying to figure it out, or you have this dream to write a book or to, to do something and you don't do it, you got to ask yourself, who loses out if I don't do this? Yeah. If you didn't decide to become the English uh, detective, the grammar detective, 
all of your students would have missed out on that. Anybody who's tuned in from all over the world would never have gotten that. And maybe they would have got discouraged from even trying to learn English because the other people who were teaching it was too complicated or yep. they made them feel stupid. So like talk a little bit about like, like why did you really decide to go down this path? Were you thinking about that? Was it just about you? Like what was going on in your yeah. mind when you said, I, I gotta, I gotta try. Yeah. It's, was specifically with the grammar detective thing you mean yeah 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 well as i said earlier that popped up during the pandemic i was alone at home i had one i had the contract to teach the online class to japan once a month wow. so i needed to buy a whiteboard i needed to get a, a live setup but that's once a month now it's a good contract they pay me well but i thought what else can i do while i'm locked up at home to reach students around the world who are also locked up. They can't travel to study English. Um, they probably can't even go to their own classes in their country. What can I do with this equipment, with my knowledge that can help them feel less alone? Cause I felt very alone. Mm. I mean, I'm married, my wife was working during the pandemic. So during the day she'd be working and coming home at night, but. So what does your wife do? She's a nurse. She works oh, okay. in the operating wow. room. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Wow. So no, you know, the pandemic just made them busier. Yeah. Um, but it was during that pandemic when isolation and loneliness were a factor from every, for everybody. And even someone like me who spends a lot of time, I, I've always been a loner since childhood. So I'm comfortable being alone. I'm comfortable being at home alone. But even I felt, you know, I missed the contact. I missed the, at least the occasional brainstorming and collaboration and chat. I'm not a complete shut in. I do love people. I just can't be around them for too much. And in fact, the pandemic was a blessing in disguise because working at a language school, I'm just surrounded by people constantly. And it was, it was stressful and exhausting in a different way. Mm -hmm. When I did my first live stream, I thought, well, you know, I don't know how many people are going to see this. I have a small YouTube channel with English weirdness. So I, but I went live and the first day I went live, I think I probably had 20 people watching live, but the thing is good. they were all from different countries mm. and the, none of them were my students from language school. I didn't know any of them. They just discovered me on YouTube and I was just blown away that here I am in my little room, my little home studio in Vancouver. And there's a guy from, Kenya, there's someone from Korea, there's someone from Vietnam, there's someone who stayed up till 2 a.m. in Belgium to watch my show. And I thought, all right. So, and of course, they they had all this great things to say about, wow, this is fantastic. I can't believe you're doing this. Thank you so much. And I thought, wow, this is something, right? I can still teach, but in a, in a very different way, you know? Right. And uh, I had not yet discovered the grammar detective theme that came about a year later, but I was doing the grammar detective stuff because that's how I taught. Right. What I call it, what's known as inductive analysis, which is really just investigation. You take like an example sentence and you work backwards and break it down and help people learn what's going on in the sentence rather than like teach them a rule and then make an example sentence. You work the other way around. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I had such a blast doing it, but realized that I was helping so many people. I also started to learn that those people that would watch the show are not the kind of students I used to teach at a language school. Language school is an expensive proposition. You know, coming to Vancouver to stay for six months at a homestay, that's expensive. I was teaching rich kids at right. the language school, right? That's the only one that comes to the only type of student that comes to Vancouver and goes to a language school, unless they've financed it themselves. But with the live show, I'm reaching people all over the world in developing countries for whom English education is out of reach. So if I can help them a little bit, and it seemed like I was, I thought this is something I should keep doing. Um, it costs me money. It doesn't make me money. But I know it's something that has value for these people. The other thing that I kind of kind of occurred to me around that time, Danny, was we kind of touched on it earlier before we recorded, like 
I didn't choose to grow up in Canada. Mm -hmm. My parents just threw me into this place for better or worse. Yeah. For worse means we're living in a snowy wasteland in the winter and some of us don't like snow or cold. <laughs> I don't. <laughs> but for better, we're thrown into an English speaking environment. And I spent my life being really good at English. I read, I was good in English class. And I was, but the main thing is I was given English as a gift from my parents. That was a, that was a, a, her, a heritage from my parents. And yet for most of the world, English is something so precious, they'll pay money for it. They'll mm -hmm. save for years to be able to take a, an English class. So I felt when I, when I started realizing that perspective, I realized I have some gift. I have a gift of English combined with my education, but my, it's the gift of my, of my parents. I have a gift for this thing that the rest of the world would, you know, would kill for. Absolutely. Therefore, I have an obligation to share it, you know, and not hoard it because were I to die and not having shared it, that's a waste. That's that waste you're talking about. Like who would miss out if I hadn't done this? Well, a lot of people, it turns out, if I didn't and, share and, my... And their, and their families and their friends that are connected. Yeah. Like, I think sometimes we, we look at, I really want to make a difference, but um, like... I'm not extroverted. I don't know how to speak. And yeah. and like, you're a perfect example of somebody who's really introverted, yeah. who comes out here and does these live shows and speaks to people all over the world. And people would have no idea that you're an introverted person because of yeah. how great a, a teacher you are. Right. Thank and you. you taught at a, a, you were, you were a teacher at a, a language school surrounded yeah. by young people. So yeah. I, I think for some people, I think it's important for, for the understand is that you have to learn to do things afraid. Like, yeah, you're never gonna be fully ready to do something, and you're never gonna fully believe that you can do it until you do it. You know, I have to tell people. People are probably tired of hearing me say this, but you know, the one of the biggest lies we've ever been told is that you just gotta believe in yourself. Like, yeah. that's that's not true at all. Like, what, what are you no. talking about? No one fully believes in themselves in the beginning. Yeah. Right. So progress equals belief. Yeah. The more progress you start to make on something that you're doing, the more you can actually think, the more you start to think I can, well, I, maybe I can do this. And then yeah. that opens your mind up to can, yeah. all kinds of other things. And so like for you, when I'm hearing you talk, it's like, it's an example of that. Like you just yeah. got started. There's no roadmap. There's no, you started and yeah. then it ends up being this thing helping people around the world. And so I think for me, like when I, when I hear that, one of the things that I, I want to ask you is like, now that you're out there, you're an entrepreneur, you're helping all these people talk a little bit about the challenges in the, in those days. I don't know if you've ever felt like this, that you just yeah. feel like, why am I doing this all the time? I should be further ahead. Cause I have those days where I feel like quitting. And so Every like day. talk a little bit about that and, and what keeps you going. Yeah. This I this might be more of a challenge for introverts because you spend more of your time alone and you don't have that support network. And as I said, I, I've never really had a support network. I've had friends. I've even had people around me in my life who discourage me actively from things I wanted to do. Uh, if I tried something new, I'd be mocked by supposed friends or just no support, no engagement, no you know, I start a YouTube channel and there were people close to me who didn't bother to take even a look, Wow. you know, start making live videos. There are people close to me, not once bothered to just tune in for one show. And I've done 130 almost. Wow. So you start to learn as an entrepreneur, but especially an introvert entrepreneur that you're, you're on your own, right? Like the, the, the no one's coming to save you. Right. But the, you do have what you need to get started. I've always been pretty self-disciplined and motivated, not, not lazy, right? I have a good work ethic. So for me, starting isn't necessarily hard, right? I've always been curious. Um, I'm that kid in the library still, right? Oh, there's a book. I'll read it. Oh, there's a library. I'll just go live in it for the day. So my curiosity has always been my motivator. Mm. And 
when I try new things, I, I'm not afraid to try them. Not everything, right? There are things I know I'm, I just don't, I shouldn't be doing. Uh, but there are things, especially within my field of interest, it's like if I have even a remote chance of doing it, I'm diving all in. The challenge comes when you are totally on your own and you have questions and you can't get the answers. Um, it never occurred to me until more recently that there were coaches out there that I could hire and get help from. Some of them may be too expensive to, to hire, but the online world is full of help. I just didn't know that when I got started. But the real challenge comes from this, this being alone, which means when you have micro failures or macro failures, little things go wrong or little things you screw up or major screw ups, there's no one to around you to say, hey, don't worry about it. That's nothing. This is all you need to do. And then go forward. You have to dwell in that failure for a long time. And I'm very self-conscious and very self-critical. So I beat myself up for those little setbacks and failures. And there's no one to pull me out, at least until my wife gets home and says, you know, snap out of it. You're all good. Uh, because as long as ultimately, and you're a married man, so you know this, doesn't matter how bad I screw up on anything else. If my wife is coming home to me that, that night, it's a victory. Yeah. I'm still married for another day. And I started to use that as an empowering. I mean, she's been an incredibly empowering force in my life because it doesn't matter to her whether anybody watched my live stream or any of that, any failures don't matter because um, we're together on it. So that support system, whatever you, whatever support system you have around you, you, you absolutely have to find it in some form. Um, but for the entrepreneur who's an introvert or doing a project like streaming as I do, which I do entirely by myself, you have to learn how to support yourself mm -hmm. and not kick yourself. Yeah. And that's a daily struggle for me because almost every day I fall into the trap of like, well, I don't have a million viewers. I'm not making money at this. It's time to give it up. It's costing me money. Business is low. How do I get... You know, there's so many new skills to learn when you're an entrepreneur, especially when you're alone. You got to learn marketing. You got to learn all that stuff. Yeah. And uh, on the one hand, the online virtual space and the technology and the internet and all this digital stuff that I can use to make videos. Uh, you know, there's a world out there of people doing the same thing or similar things, and you're in competition with them, which is fine. But you have to treat yourself well otherwise you don't stand a chance not of competing with them but of competing with yourself with the person you don't want to be for me mm -hmm. that's the daily competition right fighting but what against keeps you going what keeps you going like in those times like why what why don't you quit what keeps you going i think that's what because yeah. right now there's people out there that might have started something they might have started a side yeah. hustle a business started writing their book whatever and exactly what you said these negative yeah. thoughts and limiting beliefs come in. Who are you to think that you can write a book? Who are you to, you know, you're not a business owner. Yeah. Why are you trying this? Or like you said, other people's negative opinions. So what keeps you going? Like that's what yeah. people are probably going to be wondering right now. What, how, what keeps you going? Yeah. Um, a couple of things. And this is, a, this is a great time for this conversation because I was, uh, my main business, the thing that makes me my income is private tutoring, private coaching of English learners, namely uh, student writers in college and high school and stuff. And last year was great. My little home business that I started after the pandemic has grown pretty well. It's, it's kept me going. And I was really busy up until June, July. And then August came and the business just went the floor. Mm. Naturally, I get self-conscious. Maybe I'm just bad at this. Or maybe uh, something out there is happening that's just inflation people don't have the money to spend on tutors or maybe ai has entered and students don't need english coaching anymore because they've got chat gpt to solve their problems i don't know but it makes me feel like okay i've got a problem on my hands that you know should i even continue this or just get a job across the street at, at the store or something i don't know so that's what i've been going through lately and i should have in all in all reasonability, given up my live streaming, given up all that stuff because it cost me money. And at a time where my business is slow, 
Should I really be devoting money to my hobbies? Well, I think to myself, and this is where the motivation kicks in. It's like, well, remember how I got here. Remember the stories I just told you and your audience about how my life brought me here to this point where I'm combining all my passions. I can't give that up. Not at this stage for sure. I'm, I'm 58 heading on into, if I make it, you know, into the senior years. And so these are my passions. I've whittled down the life and sort of sculpted it out and carved out all the crap that I don't want in my life, right? Get rid of that stuff. And what, what are you left with? You're left with the essentials. Well, I'm, I'm surrounded by the essentials. I work from home. And because business is slow, I've now got more time to write. Mm-hmm. So I'm writing a novel. I'm spending more time doing that. I'm continuing with the live stream, even though it costs me money I don't necessarily have because I love doing it. Mm-hmm. It gives me a chance to be theatrical. It gives me a chance to perform, to connect with others. I have fun making the videos with the detective theme and the old movie style. Um, and I have guests on. So I get to connect with other educators and learners and interesting folks. So the fact that I remind myself, no, these are the things you've spent your life working to get to. Yes. That you've you struggled to give yourself permission to do. These are the precious things. Money is going to come and go. And I'm fortunate that I have a wife with a good job. So I can survive. We can survive together the ups and downs of my of my uh, private business. But um I remind myself that no, this is it, man. This is this is your this is your this is what you're doing your thing. Have faith no, in it. No, I love what it's you said. To, there's, there's a couple it's lessons. Hard to have. Here. No, there's a couple lessons here. Like the first one is I always say this: you got to make your why bigger than your whining. You got to make your yeah. why bigger than your whining. Like the reason why you got started, the reason why you do what you do, the reason why you have that dream has to be bigger than all the excuses and the yeah. reasons that you have to quit. You know, yeah. and 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 the other lesson is you got to turn, you, you know, you have to learn to turn your setbacks into opportunities. Yeah. Like, you know, I was just on the, this flow radio station here in Toronto, in Toronto, Canada, and I go there for Mindset Mondays and the host read, she asked me a question. You're like, you know, how can people tap into more abundance right now in this, in these times? And I said, you got to make four changes. You make these yeah. four changes in your life, your life's going to change. You got to change your language and not the language that you're talking about, but change the way that you talk to and about yourself. Yeah. You got to change your perspective. So when you look at where you are and you're not happy with where you want to be, if you continue down that path, it's going to take you down that path. But where is the opportunity in where you are? And you you demonstrated that. Like, this is the opportunity, Right. And then the other, the third change is you got to change your actions. Like what you're doing every day isn't working for you. So that means you got to do something different. Yeah. Wake up different. Maybe you're not a reader. Maybe you can read. Maybe you got to exercise. Maybe if you're a solo person like you, you have to become a part of a community. Yeah. Because a community is going to lift you up. A community is going to give you the answers. There's other like-minded people who might feel the same way you feel. And now, even if you they have no answers, you don't feel like you're alone. So changing your actions. And then the last change is to change your habits, like the things that you do on autopilot. And I think if people, I've coached, I don't know, I was trying to figure this out the other day. I've coached like, I don't know, almost 2,000 people or something like that. And that's what I realized. The people that make those four changes, who had way more difficult circumstances than you and I, who are now thriving, and the people who started with way better situations who aren't, is they they made those four changes. And so when I'm hearing you talk, I'm actually seeing a lot of the things that I've I've had to experience and I'm still experiencing, the changes, the looking for the opportunities and the setbacks. Like you're demonstrating a lot of these things. And I think it's important that I say that because sometimes people do things and they don't realize the power of what they're doing, looking for an opportunity and a setback, putting those people who don't support you at an arm's distance, 
connecting yeah. the dots and bringing everything together, all of the your childhood loves and likes and your, your education and jobs together into this one thing. So like you're actually demonstrating how to start to shift your life, even though you're still going through some challenging times. And I, I kind of wanted to po- let you know that because appreciate it. a lot of people don't understand when you're going through things and it takes an objective person outside of the situation to be able to hold a mirror up. So I just wanted to say that to you. Well, I appreciate that. And I appreciate the community and the support that you've given me. You know, as I said, I I spend most of my time doing all this stuff alone. And that's okay to a degree. But at some point, you you know, you seek support, you seek like minded people. um, And it doesn't have to be support like, you know, hey, go for it, lift yourself up every day. It can be it can take other forms like holding people accountable. And I remember receiving a message from you at some point, maybe it was um, a few months after we met in Vancouver, and you just said, hey, how's how are things going? How is that that thing? I can't remember what it was that thing we had mentioned. And that holds me accountable it reminds me, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, I should be working on that. It's like, it, it, that is so empowering. Because that's somebody who cares about what you're doing, cares about your success and your progress, and is checking in to see how is it going. They're not, they're not mocking what you're doing. They're not judging what you're doing. They're just seeing that they're just checking in if you are doing what you wanted to do. Right. Because a lot of us want to do something but don't do it for a variety of reasons. And I've found a few people, mostly almost entirely online in the last few years and developing a kind of support network where it can be as simple as something like, you know, sharing a post that they put up. Mm. You know, this is something that's so simple to do, but so few people do it. You know, I remember when I started posting videos, I would post it, I don't know, post a, a YouTube link on a Facebook page, right? And I would just marvel at how few people would do something as simple as pressing share. Yeah. And they don't realize if they shared your video, it's going to go to their little network or large network and someone in there might like it well enough to pass it along. And that's how things go viral. Mm -hmm. All it takes is a click of, of a share button. And so few people do it. It doesn't come to their mind to offer even that meager support that a, a simple click can do. But when someone does, it becomes that much more precious and powerful. And a few people did that. And I realized there are people out there that value what I'm doing to the point where they'll, what I'm saying is that that simple gesture of sharing or reposting something you've done becomes incredibly powerful, incredibly valuable because of how few times other people do it, even those close to you, family even. Yeah. And and that woke me up to the idea that you know your tribe, your support network aren't necessarily the people that you might think initially, right? Absolutely they're, they're coming not. in all forms and shapes and you should lean into it. You should value that and let them know, "Hey, I appreciate your support." I'll give you another example. I've been streaming my live stream every Friday at different times. I've experimented with the times since August 2020. Wow. All right. Yeah. I've done a lot of episodes and virtually every single episode, there is a woman in Belgium. Her name is Chris. Shout out to Chris. And I believe she's a retired art teacher. And for her, it's 2 a.m. And she diligently watches the show and shares it in her network on social media. And this is not some young millennial person who's, you know, super familiar with who can zip around uh, social media with in seconds, right? You know, she's, she's a, a Gen Xer like me. Her support has been incredibly motivating. That's an audience of one who cares deeply about what I, what I'm doing. And that person holds me accountable. I don't want to take the day off on Friday because she's going to be disappointed. She looks forward to the show. She wakes up at night or stays up late just to watch it. So, Going back to what motivates me, what keeps me going, there's a little audience out there of of, mm. of what I do. 
and they value it. And that's, that's the missing piece, I guess. The thing that I've not felt most of my life, not felt that I was valued for the person I was. I didn't grow up feeling super encouraged and supported. I've grew up thinking and being told, don't be like that, be more like this. Mm -hmm. Don't be shy, be outgoing. You'll need that to succeed in life. You know, stop playing with books and toys and dreaming about movies. Get out and mow the lawn. Yeah. So you start, but, but, you start to internalize to say, that. But, but I also think it's important too because it's really about consistency, right? Like you've yeah. had uh, you, you 130 episodes. This is like 160 something, 67, 8, 6, 70 episodes of the Grind and Gratitude show. And it's difficult like to yeah. get up to record or to have a guest or to just do a solo episode. I was doing it while I was traveling. And I was just like, you know, there were some times where I took a couple of weeks off, but I've missed very few Mondays in the last three years. And it's tough. And it's mm -hmm. like, man, why am I doing this? Like I should be on a different level. You know, I should have money flowing in for sponsorship and all that. And then I get a message from somebody in Brazil or mm -hmm. one of my friends saw it or somebody shares it. And you're right, people don't understand the power of sharing. Like before I used to get disappointed because certain people didn't support the podcast or the Champion You community. And I was like, well, why don't they dislike it? And then I realized like, it's not about those individuals. Yeah. And, and that's why I said, um, it's actually disrespectful to quit on your dreams. Yeah. Because the people who support you and secretly watch you, who may never say anything, still tune in. They're still watching you, but they may never say anything. You're motivating and inspiring them. And so I told some people, I said, look, you quitting on your dream is disrespectful. You acknowledging haters is disrespectful. I never, you'll never, I don't acknowledge people who don't believe in me because it's disrespectful yeah. to the people who do. Yeah. And I'm so fortunate that I have eight or nine or 10 people that share my stuff regularly that comment and like and what i want what i want you to understand too is you you actually already alluded to it it doesn't matter the size of your audience because the one person who's watching may be in a position to amplify your message more than you thought and you already demonstrated yeah. that with the one student that actually got you the teaching job in japan she yeah. your audience wasn't huge it was just somebody who would, a student that liked what you were teaching, told her mother who could make a decision to hire you to teach at a school in Japan. And so yeah. I want people to understand this. It, you don't need 5 million people. If you're just making a difference to one person, first of all, what does that mean to that person and their family and the community they serve? And second of all, you don't know who that person is connected to or who that person is, period, and how they may be able to bless you for, for what you provided to them. And I think a lot of people need to understand that. Like, yeah, my audience isn't massive, massive. And the amount of opportunities that I've had where someone said, I love what you're doing. You know, here's a, a ticket front row to the Raptors game. Here's a this, or I need to put connect you to this person. And that connection opened up a different opportunity. So I think we have to understand we cannot compare ourselves to other people. Because sometimes you don't even know what's going on behind the scenes. You look at one yeah. individual, you might not know there's a whole machine behind them. You know, sometimes I was comparing myself to this podcaster and I, I go and do my research and they have a whole production company behind them. Yes. And an agent, the, the agent books guests on their show. And I'm like, I'm comparing myself to this person. It's just me and one other person doing my show. So mm -hmm. I just wanted to say that because I think it. You, you've you actually connected so many things and it's important to keep going. And and maybe for some people, they might be saying, you know what? I, maybe this wasn't even my dream. I should quit this. And that's okay too. Yeah. If you realize that, you know what? You don't really want something as much as you thought you did. It's okay. But I think we have to give ourselves permission to at least try. And, and you're, you're exemplifying that, you know? Yeah. And- and so I kind of wanted to bring that to your attention. And the other thing that I want to tell you is like watching your show and watching you, like I just learned so much from you in terms of like 
presence on camera. Like you, hmm. and I watch your show sometimes and I should tell you more, but I just watch the way you are, the way you answer the questions and the way you interact with the audience. I just want to say it's amazing, man. You know, I'm learning a lot from you. I don't do I a lot of that. live um, streaming yet. I'm thinking about it, but I, I actually sit down with a notepad and make notes from you. So I, I just wanted to let you know that, man, that I, I'm, I'm watching and I probably should let you know a little bit more, but thank well, I you. I appreciate it. That's uh, you're welcome, man. That's like, uh, that's the last thing I expected to hear because like I said, I'm at heart, I'm really kind of a shy person. So the idea of being a good communicator in any way is kind of weird. It's kind of ironic. And it, I, I do remember this insight happening when I worked at the language school. I remember talking with my, um, my boss, the academic director in a, in a performance review, and I always did really well, had great reviews from the students, and that's what really counted. Um, and I, I found myself saying something one day that just came out of nowhere, but it was an insight that I, I had to be honest about. And I realized after a few years of teaching English that I was surrounded by great teachers. And I realized I'm not a great teacher, not at all. Maybe I don't even enjoy it. What I love is the language itself. Mm. And what I'm good at is explaining how the language works. So my relationship, the, the primary relationship I have is not with my students. That's hard work for me. It's hard mm. work for me to have any kind of relationships. I'm just not good at that. I've never been. It's always hard work for me to make friends, to have a social life, to do anything like that. I work hard at it. I, I'm a, I think I'm a decent person. I'm easy to get along with. I try to be really open to my students, but that was always the work. What's not work, what was always really natural was when that student or another teacher asked me a question about the language, mm. a light bulb would switch on and something would transform in a second with me and my mind would dive inside the language and then I'd be off. I'd be in a trance. Mm. And enough people noticed me doing that whether it were my students or my colleagues, and they would say, wow, that's, that's crazy that you can do that. And I couldn't even explain it necessarily. And when I decided to do the live show, I thought, how, what, what, what can I do with this equipment? Going back to that, I thought, I'm going to do that. I'm not going to teach lessons the way other uh, English teachers do on YouTube. I'm not going to deliver a curriculum. What I'm going to do is I'm going to stand up on camera and invite the audience to ask me questions. Because without that, if I have to volunteer, okay, like today I'm going to teach you this, nothing comes to mind. If I, if I think, okay, I'm going to make a video and, or a podcast, I'm going to say a bunch of stuff that the world needs to hear, nothing comes to mind. When someone suggests, hey, you need to make more content on LinkedIn to get more connections, I'm like, I have nothing to say. But if someone asks me a question, mm. that thing goes off. And it's me and the language on the whiteboard, and I'm in a trance. I'm, I mean, I'm literally alone in this room, and it's me and the whiteboard and a marker and the language, and that's, that's something I know no other YouTube English teacher is doing. Mm -hmm. And maybe, maybe that's my unique little thing. No, it is. And, and so when what you're observing is me doing that, it's not... I, 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 it's like, it's, it's a kind of a performance art, me dressed up as the detective and all that, but it's just me. I like, I can ignore the camera once it's on, once it's running, once it's all going, I, I'm not thinking. It's the weird thing, Danny. It's like, as an introverted person, I'm extremely self-conscious. Mm -hmm. If I'm going, if I'm going over to my best friend's place in the summer for a barbecue i spend hours getting ready wow because it's like I, okay i gotta shave i gotta i'm choosing clothes for my best friend yeah right I, i'm so self-conscious and worried about socializing it's it's a lot of work for me my wife laughs at me um so for me to be on camera seems like the last thing in the world i should be doing mm -hmm. but i've discovered this format where I can, I can do this thing that I do when I'm asked a question. 
um, that activates something. For, I'm still that shy kid yeah. all alone in the library in his thoughts until someone asks me a question. And then I can be, then I can be interactive to a degree, or then almost, I can. It's almost like a persona. You know, I talk to people who are extremely Weird, introverted yeah. about public speaking. They're like, I, I can't. And I say, well, and my friend, Jamie Morgan Brown, he's great. He used to be an actor and he teaches people how to speak as well. And it's like, you need a persona. And once people lock into that persona, it's like they lose themselves. Like, yeah, I, I've coached some people that have become, I mean, extreme introverts, even more than you. And when they, st I've seen them on a the stage. I'm like, this is unbelievable. They're phenomenal yeah. because they take on this persona. And yeah. so I, 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 I love what you're saying. And, you know, I want to say this, I'm going to ask you a couple more questions, but uh, before we wrap up, but I want to say this, it's like, as you're talking to me, I'm already seeing two different business ideas for you. Like one is you actually teaching people who are extremely introverted how to speak, like how to mm. show up on a camera. Like you would be surprised how many, like even to show up for a Zoom meeting, not even necessarily yeah. YouTube. Like I could see that as a whole other business oh. for you, like working with people who are extremely introverted to sort of come out into the world, whether it's physical world or virtual world. So, I mean, I see that for you. Like, I, I wow. think that could be a whole new lane. And if you go back and you show them this, this conversation, I think people would be like, <laughs> you know, they'd be blown away. And, you know, so that's one. And the other thing that I see for you as well is, be, is teaching people like all the things that you've learned about this whole YouTube world, like yeah. the equipment and how to take a small space. And so anyway, I, I'm very, I'm like that as a coach. I'm always looking yeah. and listening. And I see those two avenues for you. And I think like they could be really big for you as well, because Never I, I meet a lot of people who are extremely introverted. And I think that you would be the perfect person mm -hmm. to open them up to, you know, getting out into the world and sharing their greatness because, you know, the, the wealthiest, like, you know, Miles Monroe said the wealthiest place on earth is the graveyard because that's where everybody's dreams are buried that never yeah. took action. And and so I think you're someone that could help a lot of people with those two areas. So I just wanted to say that to you. I appreciate it. I think a lot of people that are introverted or shy are feel like everyone's got passions and interests, but for the introvert, no one knows what they are, not even their parents when they were a kid, because they're they're even afraid to share those things with their parents. Right. Never mind, you know, show and tell at school. They kind of hide their secret world. And that, you know, that's a problem because the world needs introverts. They're the people that make the art. They practice guitar in their bedrooms for 30 years until they become a rock star. Like those skills come from that intense, alone uh, pursuit of something. I, th I think what you're, what you're noticing is that I'm passionate about something and because of that passion for language, like even my first job after high school was dishwashing full time. And even when I did that, it was about language. I was fascinated by the language that I was hearing from the multicultural kitchen. Um, I was fascinated by the, the, the names of the different products. It was, if I trace back, the thread through my whole life, it's always been words and language. Mm. Give an example that your uncle may be familiar with. You know, I, I had a nasty streak for a long time because I was unhappy with myself. And what did I do during that time? I used my knack for language, and I'm not proud of this, but it's, there's wisdom in it. I used my, nat, my knack for language for evil, quote unquote. I, w I was the guy that made nicknames for people to mock them mm. as a child and even as an adult. And my nicknames were colorful and everyone laughed. And so I kept doing it. So I was using my, it, it was always about language, right? Mm. And uh, I'm ashamed that I used it to mock people, but that's mm -hmm. the truth. I did. Mm -hmm. It wasn't because I didn't realize that that was my, that was my gift, my gift for the word, my gift for manipulating language. Um, and I was angry at myself and I projected that and put that on other people. But that yeah. common thread is that thing for language. And that's something that other people didn't recognize when I was growing up. I didn't share. 
I didn't even recognize as a gift until, until I became an English teacher. And suddenly I'm surrounded by people with much more experience than I have. And I'm the one that they come to with questions about the language, not about teaching. I had mm -hmm. lots of great colleagues who were great in the classroom, great at developing in the student, the skill. I was the one who could dissect a piece of language. So my, my advice to introverts is find out what that thing is that you did alone and didn't share with other people. Because if you can harness that and tap into it, you can share that on camera with anybody because you will overcome your self-consciousness. You'll be in that persona as you speak. For me, it's the grammar detective. It's liberating because I don't have to care about myself because I'm the grammar detective on camera. Mm -hmm. And the, the truest part of that performance is me with that language. That's when Paul Duke appears. Um, but I don't have to worry about, about the other stuff. That makes and me nervous, you know. This that right there is 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 a gem, man. What you just said, like look for those threads. What do people yeah. tell you you're really great at? What is something that you sit and you imagine about, but you just haven't taken yeah. action on? There's probably some clues in there that's going to lead you to where you want to go. Look, man. And even the bad stuff. Even the bad right? stuff. Even the bad stuff. This man. Paul, I could talk to you for hours, man. <laughs> As we did I, I, the three, too. Yeah. we talked for three hours, but man, I, I think that. You drop some some serious gems here, man. And people are going to see a lot of value in this, whether you're an introvert or I not, so. or whether, like you just said, so many things that oh, I talk about in the it. book and so many things that I coach on and so many things that I've had to go through in my own journey and self-awareness. Yep. So, you know, I just want to thank you for kind of sharing those things. And I have two last questions that I ask everybody who comes on the show. Okay. Um, the first question is, what does the word grind mean to you? Getting up and getting after it, whether you feel like, you know, if you wake up and you choose to stay alive for another day, the philosopher Albert Camus always talked about life is a choice because you could kill yourself. So if you start the day agreeing to live for another day, assuming you you have the health, you've chosen not to kill yourself. I mean, it's grim proposition, but it's a liberating proposition. Okay, I'm gonna live today. You, you have no choice but to decide what you're gonna do with that day. So if you have something that you want, that day that you've, you've been given, right? You have your health, you woke up, you didn't die in your sleep, and secondly, you've chosen not to kill yourself for another day. Now you have a day at your disposal. Now you have to choose what to do with it. And if you have dreams or goals or ambitions, even if it's just going for a bicycle ride or hitting the gym, you have an obligation to go and do it, right? And, and it doesn't matter how you feel. It doesn't matter if you're going to make money or not. Because that day will have no meaning unless you go and do that thing. So for me, I do have clear goals now that I've had for the last 10, 15 years that I didn't have all of my life. I had no goals because I wouldn't give myself permission to pursue the things I really wanted. So I have clear goals. Mm -hmm. And the clock's ticking for me. I'm not a young, young buck anymore. Mm -hmm. So every moment is precious. When I hear young people say, oh, I'm bored. What are you doing? I'm bored impossible for me to even conceive there 24 hours is not enough time to do the things I want to do. So for me, grind is about getting up and getting after it. Despite fears, despite fatigue, despite the naysayers and the haters, despite memories of being discouraged, despite memories of being mocked, despite memories of shameful behavior on my own part, mm -hmm. where I was angry and unsatisfied with my life. And I put that out on other people unfairly. Shame can hold you back. Guilt can hold you back. You can wake up and think, oh, I'm a, I'm a dirt bag for being like that 20 years ago. Um, or you can free yourself and say, I'm sorry for that stuff. I'll do better today. So that's the grind to me. It's wow. about getting after your goals without excuse and also giving yourself daily permission to pursue those goals, despite all the stuff you've done in the past whether it's, you know, a legal crime, 
a, a moral crime of being mean to someone, uh, you know, treating someone badly that you wish you hadn't treated that way. Every day is a decision. And that's for me, the grind. Um, wow. I love that. It's man. not easy. <laughs> No, I love it's that. I easy. think that's that's really powerful. And and I'll also say that if, if there is anybody out there contemplating suicide, like, please make sure that you seek out help. You know, yeah. that's not the message, but I think you just make sure that you seek out help. But yeah. I love I love your perspective on grind. And my very last question is, what is gratitude to you? Yeah. Well, at this age, as I said, first and foremost, I'm grateful every day I do wake up because I believe I have a lot to wake up to. Um, I want to wake up every day to my wife. Number one, I'm grateful for my wife. We didn't talk much about her in this show, but she completely transformed my life and she completely liberated me because I felt her love and her support and her unconditional belief in me. That was the liberating force I never felt in my life because I never gave myself self-love. Mm -hmm. was incapable of it. So I was missing that piece. So I'm grateful for her and I want to wake up every day and spend another day with her and helping her. It goes without saying, but it needs to be said. So I'm grateful for the health and I don't take it for granted. I get to the gym every day, think about what I'm eating, eat, try to eat well. Grateful for the health that wakes me up for another day. Grateful for the people in my life that believe in me my wife, you, um, grateful for old friendships that are still around, including some that were strained at a, at a certain point, like with your uncle. Mm -hmm. uh, we've, we've gotten close again through the magic of the internet. I'm grateful for the internet, um, for bringing, for allowing an introvert to connect to strangers. Um, I'm grateful for a lot of things, but it, for me, it starts every day with, with the magic of being alive. When you're young, you take that stuff for granted because it's just so automatic that you wake up the next day. But the older you get, you realize, no, no, it doesn't work like that. I'm at an age where a lot of people around me have dropped off, mm -hmm. uh, including recently. And so I don't take that for granted at all. Yeah. So my day starts with the gratitude I feel for, okay, I've got another gift. I've got another day here. Me too. And, yeah. and that, gets, that gets me grinding because I don't want to waste that day. Man, Paul, whew, you dropped some gems in here, man. I, listen, I know that uh, people are going to get a lot of value out of this, this conversation. And um, I know that they're going to want to connect with you. I just want to say thank you so much for taking the yeah, time to be on the show. Thank like, you. I really, really appreciate you taking the time coming and having this conversation with me. Um, so let people know how they can connect with you. Gosh, um, I'm all over the place. You can find The Grammar Detective on YouTube, at The Grammar Detective. You can find me on my website, www.hardboiledenglish, hardboiledenglish.com, uh, hardboiledenglish6 at gmail.com if you want to send me an email. Uh, at The Grammar Detective will get you... We will you'll you'll find me on YouTube, Instagram, LinkedIn, Facebook, TikTok, Twitter, Twitch. <laughs> Two new platforms, Live Space and Rumble, are now wow. hosting my shows. Wow. Um we'll make sure we yeah. put everything in the show notes. They'll have yeah, all, sure. of, yeah. all the show notes and everything. You'll have everything there. But um, man, thanks again for being on the show. I can definitely see that we're gonna need a part two. Uh, thank you it. so much Anytime. for being here and everybody who's tuned into the grind and gratitude show as always i got much love for you make sure that you leave a comment and let us know your biggest takeaways from this video and leave a podcast review it's very very um, uh, valuable for us so thank you so much again this has been the grind and gratitude show thank you so much paul duke for being the guest and we will thank catch you danny you in the Appreciate next episode it.